listening to the Intellectual Network at theintellectual.com. And now, the Intellectual Podcast. Welcome to another episode of The Intellectual. I'm your host, David Dawson. And with me today is one of my really, really dear friends, the voice of San Diego Polo, Mr. Steve Lewandowski. And before we get into the interview with Steve, I'm going to play a little bit of uh, audio from a piece that was run on Steve in his uh, anniversary year at the San Diego Polo Club. And uh, you get a little feel for who he is from that. It's known as the Sport of Kings. Look at that. He's on the breakaway. A big shot. One more could finish it off. And he does. I'm Steve Lewandowski, and I'm the voice of polo at the San Diego Polo Club. Diego Flaherty. Even as far back as grade school, the teachers would have me do the PA announcements in the morning at school. High ball game on this beautiful, glorious Bastille Day afternoon. Carried over to uh, to college. I went to voiceover school and took some sports announcing classes. I announce a lot in Canada, Mexico, Ireland. Alberto Almasfino in Del Mundo. Estudio. I've had some tremendous compliments. Uh, you know, some people say uh, uh, Vin Scully. Gaston Von Vernick coming up to the ball. I'm who I am and, and have developed my, my own style after the last few years, but it's fun when you hear stuff like that. And just crushes the pilota. I hope to do this the, the rest of my days. And that, my friends, is a little slice of the wonder that is Steve Lewandowski announcing polo. Steve, thanks for joining us on the show. Good to be here, Dave. Um, so you have been announcing at the Polo Club for how long? This will be my 24th season coming up this year. 24 seasons. Yeah. Now, uh, the Polo Club was your first polo gig? Yeah, yeah. I started playing polo first. I met uh, a lady who was a third generation polo player, and that was my really only introduction to polo. I'd played rugby in college and in the Navy, and one of those times we had a tournament uh, that was held on a polo field, but there was no polo going on. <laughs> right. So she was the one that uh, that introduced me to polo, and um, it, I mean, I had no idea that it was going to change my life. It was, I mean, she had some horses. We went trail riding. Then she said, here, put a mallet in your hands. Ah, here, let's do a little stick and ball. Here, let's let's play a little scrimmage. Here, you know, why don't you start taking some lessons? And, <laughs> you know, s- several years later, son of a gun. <laughs> so you learned the game uh, with her. And then how, how did the announcing come about? We uh, we were doing an exhibition at the Del Mar Fairgrounds uh, during the fair, and uh, uh, the general manager, who was the announcer at the time, this was like 1991, he scheduled himself in a game, and he couldn't announce at the same time. <laughs> so uh, my uh, that the lady that I was telling you about, she said, "Well, you know, Stephen will announce." And I, I didn't know that. And I said, oh, Stephen will, huh? <laughs> and, uh, it's always a woman gets us into trouble. Uh, yeah, exactly. I found <laughs> she was, you're announcing today. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it, 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 it turned out fairly well. I mean, it turned out fairly well. I even had a lady who was in attendance, and she came down after the match, and she said, give me your demo tape. <laughs> And I didn't know. I don't have one. (laughs) I didn't even know what she meant. I really didn't. I said, you bet I will. Give me your card. (laughs) I found out what a demo tape was. (laughs) Run around frantically trying to find a studio to record some stuff. Yeah. I asked a couple of people, what's a demo tape? Well, is this? And I go, wow, that's great. And they go, yeah, it is. (laughs) (laughs) So, but you you said in the, in the clip on, uh, that we just played that, uh, you'd done some announcing, you'd done some voiceover stuff in college or or studied voice in college. Right. Um, So you're kind of, had a little bit of an idea that that's something you wanted to do. I had an inclination like uh, in the Navy, there were some uh, public address broadcasts and, and and the guys would just go, Hey, you do it. I go, all right. (laughs) You made it fun. You know, even in grade school, I remember doing one, I don't know, I was like eight or nine years old and mission impossible was a really big uh, show on TV. And, uh, 
we did an announcement along with the music of Mission Impossible and <laughs> you know, choosing the mission and your lesson. Should you choose to accept it? Choose, should you choose to accept it? And this will self destruct and all this kind of stuff. And I remember in the Navy, I did one uh, uh, that was reminiscent of the Twilight Zone. You know, mm-hmm. Rod Serling and the Twilight Zone and all that kind of stuff. So it was just, yeah. There's always kind of an inclination for it. Mm-hmm. What were you in the Navy? Um, I, I, I did, uh, security and, and, uh, air transport on the uh, USS Ranger security. Tough guy. No, <laughs> you're a big teddy bear now, but that's right. I've seen pictures of you back when you were in the Navy. You were, you were a tough guy. <laughs> um, when were you in the Navy? What, what, what period was that? Uh, early eighties, right, right. I was a ROTC, uh, person at Auburn University. And then, uh, so you graduate from college in the morning, got commissioned an officer in the afternoon, and then got my orders out here to the West Coast. I'd never been to uh, California before, but it was, you know, a very pleasant discovery. Now you're from uh, Wisconsin. Uh-huh. Uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yep. How does a Wisconsin boy choose to do Navy service? Well, we, I, I, I'm, our, Family's been in this country for three generations, and everybody in every every male in every generation has been in the service. So it's a, kind of a family tradition. Mm-hmm. You're you're a damn fine, proud American. Anybody who knows you will will, will attest to that. Um, so wow, three generations, everybody served in the in, in the service. Yep. You bet. Were you all Navy? No, no. I was the only guy Navy Navy guy. We had Marines and Army. I was the only Navy guy. Okay, yeah, because I believe my grandfather was in the army in World War Two and okay. in Korea, and then my father was in the Navy during Vietnam. Oh, okay. Um, as well as my, as well as his older brother. Um, I did not serve. I, I I tried to serve after nine eleven, but I was told I was too big for boot camp at that point. Got it. And I couldn't get myself down. That's pretty cool though that you you did. Yeah. About you know. a week after nine eleven, I walked into the recruitment office. And you know, we're pretty good friends, and I didn't know that. I, 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 I admire that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you know, I I avoided service after high school, um, mostly because I'm I'm an artist type, and I just didn't see myself serving. But uh, after nine eleven, I got to thinking, gee, if only the jocks go into military service, then we've only got jocks mentality in our military and we probably ought to have more artists and, you know, kind of other brained thinkers sure. serving yeah. it suddenly became clear to me that I had been making a mistake. Yeah. Um, so now I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of anybody who wants to go in and, and, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's something everybody should seriously consider doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think enough people do in our country, certainly anymore. I agree. It's Uh, about 1% of our population. Yeah. It it, it seems to have become something that, uh, we kind of shuffle off to, you know, quote unquote, the lower classes and, and, uh, people of privilege tend to not think about it. I think that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Um, and the military is, is still huge with you. I mean, you do all sorts of stuff. Um, in an announcing capacity and a promotion, promotion capacity, uh, for various charities and organizations. Um, you want to tell me anything about that? You bet. Um, as you probably know, I've also been, uh, a charity auctioneer last year was my 25th anniversary doing that. And, uh, I've been fortunate enough to do hundreds of them and I do them all over the country and in Mexico and I, you know, other places. And, um, I mean, I get paid because I help a lot of money to be raised, excuse me, to the bottom line. Uh, but my sweet spot, I had a mentor a long time ago said that, uh, you know, you have to choose one charity to really focus on and it's you just connect it with your passion because everything I do is worthy and valid, you know, for this disease or that disease or the, 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 the puppies, the, the children, the food, vision, leukemia, cancer, they're all good. They're all commendable. And I commend anyone's involvement with them. It's just that I've chosen as my personal passion to raise as much money as I can for military related causes. Mm-hmm. And that gives me a lot of satisfaction. 
Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, even uh, the beginning of this year, uh, I have really stepped up to the plate in getting involved with a brand new organization called Veterans Research Alliance that's dedicated to uh, medical research uh, as it pertains to the veterans space. So PTSD, TMI for recently uh, returning veterans. And then for the older guys, you know, diabetes, heart disease, shingles, etc. So it's an extraordinarily worthy cause. And all the money goes to Veterans Admin- Administration Research to to help our veterans out. So I've really stepped it up on that one. I've also been involved with Honor Flight, uh, getting dedicated to getting as many World War II and now Korean veterans back to their monuments in D.C. before they die. And that's an extraordinarily valid cause. You know, our, our, our World War II veterans did so much for us, you know, the the greatest generation, and they're perishing at at an an appalling rate because they're at that age. They're in their mid-80s to mid-90s, some of them in their low hundreds, and these guys are going away at about eight or nine hundred a day right now. Right. And so these are all worthy causes that uh, resonate with me. So I, you know, I've dedicated a part of my life to, to, and it makes me happy to do that. Mm-hmm. I'm privileged to do it. Are, are there any websites for those two organizations that we can direct listeners to? There's honorflightsandiego.org. Um, the uh, Veterans Research Alliance has just been renamed. We're working on that website. They can look at uh, veteransresearchcorp.org. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm also uh, heavily involved with the Naval Special Warfare Family Foundation. The, those guys do so much, and, and their families do so much. So it's uh, nswff.org or eliteforces.org will get you in there as well. Okay. And we'll be sure to put links to those okay, on, thank on you. the show page. Perfect. Um, so people have a place to go and, and quickly pull them up if they can't remember from the show. Sure. And, and I just got to do a fundraiser, as you know, about a month ago at the Ronald Reagan Museum in uh, Simi Valley for the Iraq, uh, Afghanistan Veterans of America, along with the Navy uh, SEAL Family Foundation. And I was able to do that, uh, co-host it with Adam Carolla and be the uh, from Fox. He's kind of a comedian. Well, he, he he's one of the biggest podcasters in the business, actually. So uh, anybody listening to a podcast knows who Adam Carolla is. Okay, cool. <laughs> And we had we had Iron Mike Thornton there, the most uh, decorated Navy SEAL, including he's also a Medal of Honor recipient. Great wow. guy. And uh, Kevin Costner, he he was there. Got to got to work with him. He uh, his brother was a Vietnam veteran, so oh, okay. that was kind of cool. Yeah, Costner's like suddenly all over movies again. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> he, he was Pa Kent and uh, Man of Steel last summer, and then. Uh, He's in uh, the Jack Ryan movie that just premiered, and right. he's got another spy movie coming up. I saw a trailer for last night. I was like, wow. You didn't see much of him for a few years. Now he's everywhere. Well, his bank account was getting low. I think it's <laughs> only at seven hundred, seven hundred fifty million or something like that. He's got to get it back up there. Costner's got to eat. <laughs> Daddy's got to eat. He's got to feed his kids. <laughs> so you, um, you've announced polo all over the world. Um, what were some of the highlights of your polo announcing career? I really enjoyed Ireland. I, I was doing a polo match in the desert here in Southern California, and there was a guy that was a representative of that club, and he said, hey, would you ever consider going over to Ireland to announce it, uh, an event that we might be having? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I, I really would. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, you hear a lot of that, you know, and you put it, you know, like, ah, well, yeah. well, give me your card, which the checks are signed, till the, the tickets are bought, signed. it's yeah. not real. It's not real. Yeah. And it turned out to be real, and, and it was a lot of fun. And just so happens I had some uh, relatives that lived right down the street from where the polo match was in, in, in Dublin. And every time they like it, a couple things were interesting from that match. One was that, as you know, Ireland is very green. Well, why does it, why is it green? Cause it rains a lot. Right. So right in the middle of the polo match, it started just what they call a lashing rain. I mean, it was voluminous. <laughs> and of course here it doesn't rain at all. That's why we're in a drought. Right. And uh, so no one warned me. No one told me. This was just such a normal operating procedure for them. The people that were field side retreated to these big umbrellas and the players just cantered to the sidelines and put on yellow rain slickers. Not even a word was said and continued playing polo. No, it's just. 
it's just another day for them. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It was, but it was fascinating to see because yeah, if they stopped for rain over there, they'd never get anything done. Right. <laughs> but it was, it was so fascinating to see how seamless that transition was. And another thing, a great takeaway that I had from that, number one, I knew uh, one of the guys there, he's an uh, elderly gentleman and he was proud of his son who was a priest in San Diego, and I knew his son because <laughs> we were in the same parish. Right. It was crazy. And then uh, the last thing was every time we had an announcer's booth, and every time they liked something that you said or it made them laugh or something like that, they'd send you a pint of Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> really? How much drinking did you get in oh, in that game? Oh, my goodness. I mean, they're, they're, I'm not kidding. There were 20 pints up there. <laughs> there were. You know, I had to share them. <laughs> I mean, but it was very... You're big boy, but not that big. <laughs> <laughs> I had a friend of mine from school, from Auburn, that, that was there, too. And, and, uh, and then I had some family cousins and stuff like that. And I just started handing out beers. And, <laughs> I can just picture you on, like, pint number 12. you like Bob Euchre in Major League. <laughs> Uh, somebody scored <laughs> just a little outside. <laughs> um, you also uh, did some announcing for ESPN. Is that that's correct? Right? Yeah, I did uh, did on ESPN. Uh, but another another international match to, that comes to mind is I was fortunate enough to be able to do the, to do the World Cup of Polo mm-hmm. in uh, Mexico City in I think it was 2008 and that was really rewarding because I was uh, the, the international the the World Cup is the highest level of amateur polo in the world polo used to be an olympic sport is no longer so this right. is the highest level of amateur polo on the planet and they start in various zones all around the world and by the time it gets down to the world cup you're down to 16 teams and in this instance it was like half of them were american speaking excuse me english speaking and half were spanish or or portuguese speaking right and that was just utterly fascinating to see people from all over the world uh in, involved with that and i was fortunate enough to get the gig because i was up against guys from new zealand south africa england and uh, i think it helped though that i was already on this side of the world right but it was that was just fascinating there were cocktail receptions at embassies and you know business casual was what said on the invitation of course but vis- business casual in an international setting is quite interesting right you right. know people wear different things actually the 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 fact that you're here on the on the west coast southern california area um your announcing of polo is peppered with a lot of uh spanish slang and spanish uh (laughs) words which here you know goes over fine everybody here knows what a pelota is um do you tailor a little bit your 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 delivery when you're someplace that's a bit less spanish influenced sure or, or do you just continue to be no, you. I'm I'm still me in either answer, in, in either instance. But you know, our club, as you know, has so many uh, Argentine professionals that come up and play for the summer. We have Mexican mm-hmm. professionals. We have Mexican families that uh, live on both sides of the border that are are members of our club. And you, and, you, and in the barns, you hear the the Spanish language. So uh, it, it just it bleeds over in in, in the in the polo world. Mm-hmm. And so all even the, all the the gringo polo people know exactly what you're talking about and uh, i've been told quite objectively that my spanish is uh, atrocious <laughs> but that's part of what's fun about it though yeah, right? I, I guess <laughs> look at the white guy butchering the language <laughs> boy he's horrible it's almost cute <laughs> oh dare to dream exactly some, some hot latin woman finds you cute mm-hmm. um <laughs> so you um you you do voice over work too like commercials and and miscellaneous other projects um I, somehow in the back of my mind i seem to recall you telling me at one point that you worked on a video game yeah yeah i uh, i've done hundreds uh, of voiceovers and um, uh, I did Sony PlayStation for a couple of years. Uh, I did uh, NHL hockey and NCAA basketball. NCAA basketball, piece of cake. <laughs> uh, 
uh, the hockey was difficult because they had all those names that you had to pronounce, the oh. <laughs> Czech names, Russian names. Right. It was almost as difficult as doing, uh, I'd say the most difficult voiceover things I've done are for certain pharmaceutical products where all the names are uh, in the pharmaceutical genre and there, there's nothing to equate them to. They're right. multi-syllabic. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say nothing monosyllabic. It's multiple syllabic. And it's Meaning, just, oh, just, just craziness. I mean, where they have to have a rep right there just going over it again because phonetically on the sheet isn't sufficient. Yeah, you look at some of the names of some of those drugs, because I've worked a lot of pharmaceutical conferences um, as a AV guy, mm-hmm. um, but you look at some of the names and you're like, are you guys taking your product? Product when you name this stuff or <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like, yeah how is anybody supposed to pronounce that <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so yeah the, those russian some of those russian czech uh, finnish names were difficult i mean whoa earn my keep uh, on on those <laughs> it was fun to do though they treat you well yeah um the auctioneering how did you get into auctioneering because that's a real talent like not everybody who does voice work can do it. i don't think i could ever step in and do an auction auction uh, right the way you've done and I, i've seen you do probably a half dozen auctions now sure um and you're you're amazing at it you're, i mean you're fantastic <laughs> thank um, you how, how'd you get into auctioneering and and what is your secret to making it work because because you really get a crowd riled up Oh, I, first of all, I appreciate the compliment. Uh, what happened was uh, I was a very good friend of mine. His name's Don Blue. He's still around, lives in Solana Beach. He was on the board of directors for Make-A-Wish San Diego. And uh, he put on a, an auction, a dinner gala auction down in Coronado at a hotel. And uh, he said, gosh, I need an auctioneer. Could you help me out? And uh, he goes, you know, you can come with a date. Buy you dinner. <laughs> I said, all right. So went down there and did his auction. And uh, I, I'd like to say it was like my first announcing gig that, you know, a lady came down, asked for, a, you know, referral for more for, for more business. I, I sucked. <laughs> I was horrible. I was just horrible. But it, it planted the seed. And I think people bid because they felt sorry for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, and, and I'm not being facetious. I'm being quite <laughs> accurate. In, Come on, bid. Just pity me. <laughs> yeah, put some money down. So, so you know, I at least have that to go home with. Okay, we got we got a hundred hundred dollars. Now, could I have seventy five? No, I mean hundred and ten. I mean, uh. and they felt. I mean, women were. You could. They had that look like, oh, poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> but net net, we raised money, and believe it or not. Uh, I was asked back to do it again (laughs) and I got better. I got better. And then I started doing them and then I started doing dozens of them for free Mm -hmm. to get good because I had to learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then I, I started going to auction houses and buying lunch for guys that owned auction houses and asking them for little pointers and tips here and there. And then, uh, and then it just started going and then I started charging X amount, X amount, X amount. So it's at the point right now where, uh, I'm fortunate enough to get this going when you're in the auction season, which typically is the spring and, and, and early fall. Um, I'm, I'm usually pretty much booked up on, on every one of those days. And I have multiple choices on a lot of dates, mm-hmm. you know, like there's a couple dates where they, they seem to be the popular dates where there's four or five requests for that Saturday night. Wow. So it, um, it's really taken off, but I've, I put a lot of work into it, but I really enjoy it. And I really enjoy it because talk about seeing, it's like a, uh, a, a brick mason who builds a wall. Just think of the satisfaction that he gets after one day's work. Mm-hmm. He can see that there was nothing there. And now all of a sudden the wall is five feet tall. It's symmetrical and sturdy and gosh, darn it. He can wipe his brow and go, man, I'm proud. I did that. Right. And, and, and auctions even quicker. Uh, you can get out there. Uh, you know, I like people. I love love being around people. I get them fired up and we all have fun and I catch people at their best mm-hmm. and, and being philanthropic and we have fun and we make money for something that we believe in. Well, I think that's probably the biggest secret to your success, both in the polo announcing and in the auctioneering is I, I've said it before and I'll, I'll say it probably till the day I die. People respond to passionate people. 
And if you are coming from a place of true passion, people can read that on you. They know that you are truly enjoying what you're doing, that you're really meaning what you're saying, that you're engaged in that moment. And I think that turns people on. And in an auctioneering capacity, that's what you need, right? Like you need the, right. the people in the audience to feel something to right. open their wallets. Right. Right. I think that's probably why you're so successful at it. I'm, I'm lucky, too, that I, I, I have a, a God-given gift of, of a certain timber or tonality in my voice that gets people's attention. Because, you know, in some of these events, keep in mind, these people have been cocktailing or they're <laughs> <laughs> a little or a lot. You know, mm-hmm. we've worked gigs together where, where it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, or they're, they're still involved in their dinner. And when you start talking, you know, what's going through their mind is why in the world is this guy yapping right now? And you got to cut through that. But again, it it helps to have that timber and tonality to get their attention. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I actually had to cover for you, um, on a couple of occasions at the polo club for some corporate events. Right. And, um, they actually asked me to do. Sunday polo, like that whole season that you were gone taking care of your mom. And I, I panic. I'm like, I can't do the polo thing. You know? <laughs> I, I don't a like polo enough. And again, coming from a place of passion, I couldn't speak about it from a place of either a enough knowledge or B enough excitement to make me feel comfortable doing it. So I, I was like, I can't do Sunday. I'll cover some corporate events. Cause those are a whole different deal. Right. But even at the corporate event, it just like, I found myself more just trying to emulate you a bit. Wow, that's a great compliment, um, David. Because I couldn't find my own voice in it. Huh. And that was the only way that I could kind of get there. It was like, okay, I've seen Steve do this a couple hundred times. Yes, yeah, right. Um, yeah, a couple hundred, I, yeah. I think, I think I know where he goes with this. But, you know, I just, especially when I was talking about the, the kind of nuances of polo and going through the equipment and the, the history of it, I just... I bombed, <laughs> you know, it was like, uh, but, 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 and, and one of the polo players who was doing the demo with me, like, you know, he just took the mic and <laughs> started talking and that of course threw me off even more, you right. know, but, um, but when we got to just them playing games that they played golf cart polo, which was always hysterical, right? Right. <laughs> but, yeah, bunch, that's a lot of fun. bunch of suits drinking, <laughs> yeah. sitting with polo players in a, in a, in a golf cart. Um, that's when I had fun. Then it was like, okay, you know, a bunch of people having a good time. This I can get into. And I got into that and it all went fine. But, uh, they asked me again a little bit later, you know, can you do some more of these? I'm like, nope, <laughs> just <laughs> not, nope, no, I'm not going to do that. It's not my cup of tea. Um, well, I thought, David, I thought I set the bar sufficiently low so no. that you wouldn't have a <laughs> your bar is difficulty. Like, your bar is like <laughs> stratospherically high, sir. Um, and I watched other people try to fill in for you that season that you were gone. And I'll tell you what, attendance was lower. The enthusiasm at the polo club was lower. It just didn't translate. Um, you bring something amazing to the to the mic. And uh, it's an intangible. It's, it's one of those things that you just can't, you know, can, it's like, yeah, other people can go through the mechanics, but the, the magic, the spark that you bring is, is completely different. It's very nice of you to say. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually don't mind going to polo when you're announcing. <laughs> when you're not announcing, I probably won't show up for polo. Okay. Like, it's, it's just what it comes down to. And I think in San Diego especially, I think that's true for a lot of people. I think they won't go to polo if you're not there. Um, and you're, you're just a huge advocate for the game. Um, I know polo's kind of struggling here in San Diego right now, um, trying to get the, the crowds out and, and the attendance up. I mean, opening day is real good. Closing day is pretty good. But, you know, in, in between, uh, I know, I know it, it's, it's not a lot of people showing up on a regular basis. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I beg to disagree. We, we had our best attendance, our best season attendance wise last year. Okay. Well, I didn't go last right. year. Right. You didn't go last year. I, I only right. know about the years prior years to this prior to that. Year. Yeah. No, the attendance is, is, is up dramatically. That's um, good. Yeah. No, that's good because we're doing a lot more work with, uh, you know, a lot of the marketing and promotion people at Polo are doing a really good job of, of, of and, and I'm, I'm a small part of that, reaching out to charities to get them to do their thing at Polo because mm-hmm. Polo is synonymous with charity. And although this will be the, I think, the 108th or 109th season of Polo 
in San Diego. It's about our 28th year at this location. And since Polo has the San Diego Polo Club has been at this location, we've been instrumental in working with over 90 local and national charities to raise over $20 million. Uh, so it's a great place to raise money for for nonprofits and we've really reinvigorated that component of polo last last season that's good and um, where we're having our problems primarily are uh, uh, for a number of reasons we couldn't get our lease renewed mm-hmm. and we have a number of players who are kind of waiting on the sidelines if you will to perhaps purchase what's called lifetime memberships well you, you can't do that when you're on a 30-day revolving lease. Right. But And you're very familiar with uh, with that situation. And so hopefully we're going to get that taken care of very shortly after the next uh, mayoral election that's about three weeks away. And hopefully shortly thereafter, uh, polo and soccer can continue to be there for, you know, hopefully 20, 25 more years. Yeah, that, that's interesting. I don't think people kind of realize all this mayoral crap here in san diego affects more than just what's going on in that office right um it's it's really put a a delay on solidifying the 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 future of that right that piece of property here yeah. in san diego because the san diego surf cup is there polo's there miscellaneous right. uh, different tournaments for lacrosse rugby and lacrosse rugby and whatever roll through there throughout cricket the year. yeah um but all of them have been kind of in this period of, uh, we don't know what's going to happen for almost two years now. David, you're absolutely right. We've had uh, large groups outreach to both soccer and and Polo saying we'd like to in you know March of 2014 or March of 2015 whatever have a big event and we're going to have X amount of thousands of people and, and X amount of room nights in the hotels in the immediate mm-hmm. vicinity well when 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 we share with them uh, as we have to that we we're on a 30 day automatically extending lease they're like you know word it doesn't make any business sense for them to commit to something that's just a right. big old fat juicy maybe yeah nobody's going to put a deposit down no. on on a future that's uncertain doesn't make any any sense yeah it doesn't make any sense but i think it's going to get all worked out and uh i'm confident that polo is going to be there for uh, at least another couple of decades I, I certainly hope so because as i shared uh, polo has been an integral part of the san diego community since 1907 and even the very first polo match that was held down in coronado was for charity so, I mean, the 20 million that I speak of has been since like 1987. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, just factor in all the money that, that Polo has raised since uh, 1907 when Teddy Roosevelt was in office. Right. Um, you you were with Tony Robbins for a while, is that yes. correct? Yes, yes. What did what, you do with, with Tony Robbins? I met Tony uh, at Polo. He, he came to Polo, and, and uh, we started playing Polo together. We were on the same team. And uh, uh, one one day after, after a match, we're just kind of uh, walking our horses back to the barns, and he said, what are you up to? And we talked about it. He goes, let's go grab some lunch. So we grabbed some lunch, and he said, I've got a, a, a division of, of – Robbins Research International, where we want to do my technologies or or systems with uh, people in the uh, healthcare space, you know, chiropractic offices, doc, uh, MD offices, uh, dentist offices, etc. He goes, why don't you come on board and help us, uh, you know, with that? So I did. I, I worked with him. Uh, we went all over the country uh, talking to people about that, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Extraordinarily interesting uh, uh, opportunity, yeah, a lot of fun. He's a huge guy, right? I mean, he's a big he's guy, like enormous, big guy, big guy. He's like six seven, something like that. Wow, <laughs> big big fella. Um, the uh, the the thing that I want to thank you for on the show <laughs> is the cheese curds you sent me for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> exactly you got you it. went back to wisconsin and I, that's all i could think dude you gotta send me some cheese curds <laughs> i was so excited when it showed up in the mail believe me when they, they were in the back trunk of my car and the day i took them to the post office was it was uh 22 below with wind chill <laughs> and they were as hard as bullets <laughs> well they were soft and squeaky when they got that away good good to sunny socal <laughs> um yeah it's funny you, you just can't find cheese curds 
around here. I, not that I'm aware of. Um, There's a lot of injustice in this world, David. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't even know what I was missing until I started dating a Wisconsin girl. And she, she's like, oh, you've never had cheese curds? What? Oh. So she brought some back on one of her trips back home. Yeah, I'm sure she never had lumpia either. Uh, no, I think she had. Okay, actually, right. somehow people seem to have had lumpia more frequently than people are aware right. of the cheese curds. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, my, my my recommendation to anybody going back to Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, any of those places, get yourself some Wisconsin cheese curds. You can find them everywhere there. Yeah, pretty nowhere cool. here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you said, injustice everywhere. Yeah, so sad. Yeah. We just have to <laughs> muddle through it. <laughs> How often do you uh, make it back uh, to that area of the country? I go back a lot. I go back a lot. Uh, I don't know. About uh, two years ago, I think I made it back five or six times. Last year was about four times. So, you know, I mean, uh, that's where I'm from. My mom's back in Dubuque, Iowa. And I have uh, my godmothers in Milwaukee and, and you know, cousins, uh, friends. And, you know, part of me still there. Yeah. You, um, you've you got, like, a, a circle of friends here in SoCal that are all back from that area. And, <laughs> like, you guys get together periodically for football <laughs> games and whatever, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, how many of those guys did you know prior to being here? Like, is it a group of people that you grew up with a little bit, or is it just a bunch of guys who recognize a similar background? There's only one or two guys that I know out here that I knew in Milwaukee. And then when my dad retired, my mom and dad moved to Dubuque, Iowa, where she's from. So anyway, to answer your question is, met them all here pretty much, uh, but found out we had so much in common. And then when you start asking questions and you found out you know mutual people and there were mutual connections and all that kind of stuff but that all happened in the mid to late 80s so mm -hmm. you know i've known them as you know a long time now right yeah so um you, you went to auburn right? uh, yep um you bet and Auburn University, War Eagle, <laughs> almost for the national championships again this year. National champions against FSU. Do you, I mean, as a as a sports fan, do you chase the team around at all? Do you go watch games, or, or do you just get together with the buddies around here and, and and watch games? Both, both. I go back from time to time. You know, my my college football team is Auburn because I went there. Maybe my backup team would be Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, pro football wise, you know, sorry, it's the Green Bay Green Packers. Bay Packers. <laughs> <laughs> San Diego Chargers are my backup team. Uh, but both, I go back, I go to I go to games at Lambeau Field. I have family members that have season tickets, mm -hmm. and uh, I go to Auburn games every once in a while. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pretty loyal guy. You know, once I find something that I'm a part of, I just kind of stick with it. It's not in my nature to move on. Well, and there's something different about especially NFL fans in that area of the world. Uh, San Diego Charger fans are, by and large, they're fair-weather fans. If the team's doing okay, you'll hear a bunch of stuff about the Chargers here. If it's right. a mediocre season, you barely hear about them outside of the news covering them. Right. Um, but back, especially... Packers fans. Right. You guys are nuts. Oh, yeah. They sell out the inner squad games. <laughs> they do. Yeah. They sell out inner squad games. I mean, it's a whole nother level there. Yeah. Um, have you worn the, the cheese head hat? No. No? <laughs> no. I, the, the cheese head came about after I grew up there. Okay. You know, I'm, and I mean, God bless the people that wear them. I'm just not a cheese head hat wearing kind of guy. <laughs> well, when I was living in Dallas, um, the Packers came down to play against the Cowboys one one time, and I was working. Uh, where was I? I was working a, a part time job at the Container Store at the time uh, in Arlington. This was before the Cowboys moved their stadium okay. to Arlington. Sure, this was back when they were at Texas Stadium, uh, quite a bit further away. Uh -huh. um, and I'm working. It's the day before the Cowboys game. And there are cheeseheads walking around the, the container store with their big giant <laughs> cheese hats on. Sure, sure. It was hysterical. And I asked them, I'm like, are you from here? And, oh, no, no, we're down from Wisconsin right. for the game. <laughs> right, like, right, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The um, 
they're like, yeah, we travel everywhere the, the team goes. We, we, yeah, the, we see every game. I, I've uh, you know I went to see the Packers in the Super Bowl in New Orleans, and, and and of course the one here. But the the fanaticism, the sense of fun, the elan that they bring with them is quite unique. It mm. really is. It's not replicated in 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 cities that are even close to there. You don't have that sense of fun or a high as high a percentage of commitment with uh, Detroit or Minneapolis, which are both kind of in that neck of the woods. Mm-hmm. Um, Chicago comes close, but there's just something just a little bit different about the, the fun-loving quotient of the of the, the Packers fans. Yeah. It really is. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, like I said, it's a whole other level. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. So, you know, so I was curious. I was curious to how fanatic... You really are. That's something we've never really talked about. Yeah, I'm a shareholder. You know, one one share, <laughs> <laughs> one, one share. But you are looking at an NFL owner. There you go. And uh, but I just you know I grew up in it, when I was little. You know, it was the '60s, and the Packers were just winning just about everything in sight. I thought when I was a little kid that the Packers were similar to the Harlem Globetrotters in that that other team that they played was just kind of a patsy. <laughs> you know, I just I just expected them to win all the time. You you know, my my heroes and Vince Lombardi, they're just going to get it done no matter what. And that's uh, that stays with you, man. And then you, you, you remember being a little kid around all your 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 dad and your uncles and your cousins and all them whooping up and cheering the Packers and all that kind of stuff. It uh, it set an indelible imprint in in me. That's funny. I, I, I'm not an NFL fan and I was a bit of a Major League Baseball fan growing up. But uh, the one thing that has held true, regardless of anything else over the years, is if the Niners are on or the Giants are on, uh, I'm, I'm at least partially interested because those were the teams my father followed. Yeah. And he followed them with his grandfather right. and told me stories of sitting on the porch listening to the games on the radio and somehow just... Even keying in once in a while to see how those two teams are doing still makes me feel connected to my dad. Amen. Everything we do in life, and this is you know not my uh, feeble observation, but everything we are passionately committed to in life comes from some form of love, mm. whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, advertising has has figured that out. I mean, we do it because of love. Something we did. You know, there's kids that go hunting, and and there are uh, fathers that that go hunting and they do it and they take their sons hunting because they remember that was the only quiet time that they had to spend with their dad. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's anchored in them permanently. There's people that, that feel the same thing about cooking or bike riding or fishing or swimming or watching a a sports match. It all goes back to, to love that stays with us on a, Mm -hmm. uh, for sure on a subconscious level and maybe even more than that. Yeah. Well, you'll always have a tender place in my heart because you act as, you acted opposite my dad in the feature film that we produced and uh, <laughs> and played a you know a mob hitman. Uh, that was cool. I mean, you were awesome. I mean, you, the the hat, the suit, the whole bit. And then, the camera angle helped too. Yeah. It made me look nine feet tall. And then juxtaposed with my dad's hitman, who had a giant tattoo on the back of his bald head, but dressed in like Hawaiian shirts and stuff. You guys were such a funny pair. Silverfish. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun working with you guys. I'll always, I'll always hold that moment uh, dear to my heart. And, I do uh, too. Yeah, we were co hitmen, <laughs> and you both just seem to have so much fun doing it. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there was the whole scene where you beat up the camera guy, yeah, um, which was me. <laughs> you know, manning the camera. That was fun. That was a good time. <laughs> but it, it was so fun too. It's like you know when when we all went to the premiere and stuff like that. You know, we're we're trying to portray viciousness, but if they could have only seen that, like literally one second before you said roll or whatever, we had ear to ear grins on our faces <laughs> and we had to transition to menacing and yeah. oh, it's hilarious. It was so much malevolent. Fun. Um, have you done any other acting jobs like that before? Or? No, not, not really. Not really. No. I have to cast you in more stuff. Okay, cool, <laughs> cool. Yeah, no, that was that was fun. That was fun going. I mean, to see yourself on the big screen and all that kind of stuff. It's, yeah, it's just something like get, makes you a little giddy to see yourself thirty feet tall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and the whole theater was sold out. You know, mm-hmm. it was packed, and that was a red carpet. You know, you guys are in tuxes. I mean, it was a big deal. It's fun. Yeah, we you know we try to live it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, are there any uh, any type of voiceover jobs that you're 
you're hoping you get to do at some point. I mean, are, are you ever thought of doing like movies or be great. It's cartoons. A, yeah. You know what? Um, I, I know you can do them with, with technology being the way it is today. You could do those things from anywhere, mm-hmm. but the, 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 I don't know. I'm still, I could be wrong, but I, I still think you're under the, I'm under the impression that you have to be up in LA for the exposure to, you know, where that industry is kind of networking with them to get that shot. Mm-hmm. And, um, I did some VOs up in L.A. and Orange County uh, a few years back, and um, I, I I made the conscious decision that I'm going to live here, you know, yeah. not, not up not up there. So yeah, I've made that choice too. Yeah, for better or worse. Right. Although if the uh, couple of things that I've got coming up this year drop the way they drop, I may have to just change my tune on that. We'll see. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, um, is there, uh, anything that you would have to say to somebody who's looking into getting into voice work on how to, how to break in? Cause it, it is one of those strange, uh, professions where there's not really a lot of guidance. You know, the thing I've gotten dozens of people who have he- heard that I did that dozens of people have been introduced by mutual friends or whatever saying you know what this uh, this person has good pipes they could do this and um there's been dozens i mean i've had cups of coffee breakfasts lunches you know because i'm a i'm a helping kind of guy mm-hmm. and you know what i i pretty much almost won't do it anymore because of the dozens that have uh crossed uh, my path in the last uh, 25 plus years none of them has followed through Mm. So it's it just turns out to be a waste of time. You know, you want to be neighborly and helpful, but it takes a lot of work. Yeah. And uh, like I went to a, a school for it. I got trained for it. And then I did perhaps a couple hundred free ones. Right. And then I did a couple hundred more that were like 25 to 50 bucks each. You know, you really got to get in the trenches and be serious about it and you know a lot of times they just have these visions of showing up and going wow i could be that that tuna on that cartoon movie and just make a million and retire it's just easy well you know life doesn't work like that nothing's easy right you got to put in the work nothing's easy well this is uh in total probably in the hundreds uh for podcasts for me and you know i'm still figuring it out, you know, right. and, and getting into my groove. On yeah. It. And you're committed to it. Yeah. And I, and I don't get paid to do it. Right. <laughs> right. You know, but the hope is, is somewhere down the line, right. it, it translates into, you know, picking up, uh, gigs at, at, you know, maybe some comic cons or, or whatever, go. uh, moderating panels and doing that sort of thing. I would love to do that sort of work, but I know I'm not there yet. You know, I got to sure. I got to keep putting my time in and, yeah. and doing this show have to on be a very regular persistent. basis yep. and, and, and not let it slip and not let it fall. You know, we go out weekly and it's important that we go out every week. Right. Um, but it's it is a commitment and it's it's required me to buy buy gear and invest my time. And, yeah, a lot of people just don't have that kind of dedication. They expect everything to just happen. Instantly. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The, 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 the secret to the secret is that just having the thoughts not actually enough. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's just a wish. <laughs> yeah. It's great to have a wish. You still have to have the, the drive and the dedication to uh-huh. pursue it. You have to commit. So. Yeah. Cool. Yep. So, Steve, before we finish wrapping things up, uh, what are some of the big things you've got on the horizon for for yourself right now? Well, one of the things that I look forward to doing uh Every year, and I've been uh, fortunate enough to have been a part of it since its inception, is the Horses and Horsepower Polo Tournament in Scottsdale that's held uh, pretty much the first weekend in November every year. It's held at the Westworld uh, Equestrian Complex in North Scottsdale, and it's put on by a businessman, not a polo guy, interestingly enough. His name's Jason Rose, Rose Moser Allen Public Relations Agency, and he's taking it its inaugural year. Uh, back in, I think, 2010, they had uh, 2,400 attendees, which is not bad, you know, and then the next year, I think it was up at uh, 
north of uh, 7,500, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, this past year, it was north of 12,000. Wow. So next year, it's going to be north of 15,000. He gets sold out as far as corporate sponsors are concerned, you know, title sponsors, individual business people that have booths on the facility. And it's uh, what it is, it's a role model for how to have a highly successful polo match. And, you know, I've done polo matches all over the country, but I've never seen one more efficiently run than what he does. And again, it's it's an inter- interesting because he comes from a p- perspective that's not polo. It's right. business and promotions. I think that's often a problem for a lot of sports organizations is they've got too much of a sports mentality about everything. And they don't bring enough business to their operations. Um, certainly my experience with the San Diego Surf Cup soccer tournament um, ha- has shown how successful a sports organization can be when a business mindset is applied to the organization and the business side of holding an event. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big, uh, pivot from, uh, uh, having fun to, <laughs> to, to being organized on a, on a business level, mm-hmm. which I think anymore you kind of have to do to be successful in the long term. Right. Now that event is, uh, is that aired on TV? It is. It's on uh, Fox sports West. Fox, Arizona. Uh, there's also an equestrian channel that covers it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's live there with the, with the uh, people in attendance and then it's, it's well covered uh, on television and, and uh, uh, websites as well. Excellent. Podcasts as well. Yeah. Uh, speaking of TV, I'll, I'll take it back to the ESPN question. You, you oh. announced on ESPN. I did have the wonderful opportunity to announce on ESPN a couple of times, uh, ESPN International, ESPN2, ESPN, and uh, really fascinating experience. It really is. Uh, uh, ESPN partially covered the uh, the World Cup down in Mexico City, and then also stateside here we did the uh, Triple Crown of Polo, which was just a lot of fun. Got a lot of feedback on that. Yeah. Um what, what what is the difference between doing a kind of live polo match uh, for a crowd in the stands versus doing it on the television? Um, I don't know. They're they're a little bit different, you know. Uh, you know, if you're at the the, it also did another television thing for uh, Polo TV last year up at Santa Barbara, the mm-hmm. the uh, Pacific Coast Classic, the finals of that, which was probably one of the most dramatic polo finishes I've ever seen in my life. If you scripted it for a made for TV movie for HBO, you might have thought that that, that what happened was too outlandish for feasibility. <laughs> it was just unbelievable, from a bee sting to a guy jumping off his horse to being behind to winning in the last second. It was just so dramatic. Oh, my goodness. But uh, <laughs> the, the difference is, you know, you're, you get, uh, I don't know, there, there's just, a, it's a little busier. There's a lot more going on. You might have, uh, where if you're just doing a live match, you know, you just call the match. And if you're doing it with TV, with the headsets on, you know, you get people talking to you in the middle of stuff. So you have to have a little different level of, of concentration. It's not a problem. You know, you do it a few times and you get, you get used to it, but you just, uh, there's a little bit more going on. There's, there's more moving parts mm-hmm. uh, and, and, it, and it has to be successful because there's such an investment there. You know, there's the truck, the personnel, the set, yeah, you know, so. Okay, cool. Steve, thank you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. I'm, I'm flattered that you even had me on here, my friend. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Steve is available for auctions, for MC, for voiceover work. Um, you can. Sports announcing. Sports announcing. I've done, you know, different stuff. Yeah. He's, he's more than polo. Mm-hmm. So you can check done him football. out. I've done football. Yeah. I've done the see football rodeos some frisbee sport uh it was not you know like frisbee football or something like that frisbee golf frisbee golf yeah and and football and uh, rodeo and uh, a few other things yeah so if you're looking for a voice and you don't want to hire me <laughs> um i highly highly recommend you reach out to steve lewandowski you can find him online at steve speaks to you.com and at poloannouncer.com. Uh, he's got contact information for him at, at both of those places, as well as uh, demos and, and information about various gigs that he's done in the past. So, you know, check him out. I, I highly recommend Steve for anything you've got coming up. And, uh, you know, just give him a ring. He's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, David. All right, Steve. Thanks.
This episode of the Intellectual Network is brought to you by HostGator. If you are looking to build a website or an e-commerce site or are looking to run your own server, HostGator is the best choice for excellent customer service and some of the best hosting packages the internet has to offer. And now, you can save $9.94 off your initial package price and show your support for the intellectual by using the offer code TINHOSTING. That's T-I-N hosting at checkout. That's 10 hosting for $9.94 off the package price for whatever service you choose. So go to HostGator.com and start building your home on the web today. That's HostGator.com for all your website needs and use the offer code 10 hosting. <laughs> 